Good morning. I'd like to start by asking two questions. How many are skeptical that you can find pacifism in the Old Testament? Raise your hands. Be honest. You're really skeptical that it's there. Because, uh, as Anthony said, the, the Old Testament has a lot of violence in it. All right, how many are skeptical that you can find pacifism in the New Testament? Okay, good. I like a good challenge. Um, going to begin by my proposition. Yahweh is the sole warrior. War is punishment for sin. Abraham learned how Yahweh fights from Melchizedek. Yitzhak and Yaakov understood. Moses understood. Others partially grasped it. Yeshua restored it and modeled it. The early Christians understood it. Rome destroyed it. As the gospel of the kingdom is being restored, the message of pacifism and nonviolence is being restored. John Howard Yoder, a Mennonite theologian, in his book, The Politics of Jesus, says there was a long and spiritual and strong cultural Jewish experience with nonviolence prior to Jesus and the formation of Christianity. And that's what I hope to show you today. How do you reconcile the New Testament that says God is love, calls God the God of peace, and the gospel is called the gospel of peace, with the warlike Yahweh, Yahweh of the Old Testament? And when you read the Old Testament, it seems to be one war after another. A friend and I were talking about this, and we decided we'd go through the Bible and look at every conflict, and we would decide who initiated it. And we made a database at BibleWar.com, and you can go there and run a query. When we ran our first query, this is what we got. Who caused the wars in the Old Testament? Yahweh's at the bottom. He was not a warring God. All the bloodshed wars in the Old Testament were created by men, individuals, tribes, nations, troops. But he is called a warrior. Exodus 15.3 Yahweh is a warrior. Yahweh is his name. Genesis 9.13 I have set my bow in the cloud. And it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. The word for bow rainbow and this bow are identical. So on the cover of Millard Lynn's book called Yahweh is a Warrior, he has a, an archer's bow. The covenant is that God will defend his people. That's his promise to us. We looked at the first act of violence, Cain and Abel. It's interesting to note that neither Abraham nor God retaliated. In fact, God put a mark on Cain so that people wouldn't kill him. Soon the earth was filled with violence, so bad that God destroyed the earth with the flood. And of course, Jesus said, in the days of Noah, the earth will be as in the days of Noah will be the day when the return of the Son of Man. So we can expect a lot more violence if you think things are violent now. The whole earth will be filled with violence. Immediately after the flood, God says, all right, this is what I want you to do. Stop killing each other. The minute you start killing, you're going to set the whole thing in motion again. This is a cause and effect statement. This is not justification for capital punishment. God is not saying, I don't want bloodshed, so if he kills somebody, then you kill him. That would be more bloodshed, because then somebody had to kill the executor, and it sets off the chain. He's saying, don't kill anybody. Stop doing those things. Abraham's first temptation to go to war was when his wife was being threatened. He's down in Gerar, and I think uh, King Abimelech, and he says, he will kill me and take my wife. Isn't that what war's all about? This enemy is coming to kill me, and he's going to take my wife. Therefore, I take up arms and I kill him. But Abraham resisted this temptation, surrendered the matriarchy, gave away the, the promised woman, who was the mother of the promised child, who would be the mother of the Messiah. He surrenders her trusting fully that God would redeem her, and God redeemed her. The king did not touch her. He received his wife back. He received her back with, with I think, a substantial uh, fortune to go with it. So he resists the first temptation. We're going to come back to Abraham when we get into the New Testament because he's, he's really pivotal to this whole story. But I just want you to realize the first temptation to war is your wife. Men will fight and kill for their wives. 
he did not. Paul says that Yahweh preached the gospel to Abraham. I believe he explained how Yahweh fights. I believe he taught the gospel of peace and nonviolence and the New Testament gospel. He brings bread and wine. Those are the symbols of the new covenant. I believe he told Abraham a whole lot more than we give him credit for because Jesus said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Now, I can't prove it, but I think probably Melchizedek said the Messiah is coming. The kingdom will be restored. The kingdom that was promised to Adam when he was kicked out of the garden. And he's promised to Abraham. And he's, um, he said, one of your descendants is going to come and do it. He might have said, his name is Yeshua. I can't go that far. Interestingly enough, the Dead Sea Scrolls, a uh, couple of the ones that they dug up, said that Melchizedek was an angel, the angel of truth. He was certainly the messenger of God in this scenario. And we'll come back to Melchizedek later, too. What we do know by looking at Abraham's son, Yitzhak, was that he learned his lessons well. He had five opportunities to go to war. He too surrendered his wife. When he was attacked by the Philistines, he migrated. When he was attacked in Gerar, he migrated. The Esekians attacked him, he migrated. The people of Sitna attacked him, he migrated. He avoided bloodshed at all costs. He gave up his land, he gave up his wells. And when he reached the final destination, it says, God brought him to a, to a great, wide place, green, flowing waters, and his enemies came there and made peace treaties with him. So he resisted the temptation to go to war. He taught it to his son, Yaakov, Jacob. Rather than fight his brother for the birthright and possibly kill or be killed, he fled from Esau. He fled from his uncle Laban, who also came to do war with him. And when he returned to the land, he became, offered to make himself a vassal to Esau, bowing seven times before his brother to avoid bloodshed. Esau welcomed him back as a brother, not as a vassal. The next thing men will fight for is their daughters. They don't want an enemy coming to rape their daughter. Yaakov's daughter was raped. He refused to retaliate. He did everything within his means to bring about a peaceful solution, even offering to give his daughter in marriage to the men of Shechem, to the son of Shechem. His sons, Simeon and Levi, however, broke the Abrahamic covenant and they killed all the men in Shechem. And Yaakov did not praise them. He cursed them. He put a curse on Levi and Simeon, a curse which was never lifted. Joseph, the favored son, understood the way of peace and the way of love. When sold by his wicked brothers into Egypt and he had the chance to, to get revenge, to wipe them out, he forgave them. He welcomed them with open arms. He gave them gifts. He gave them the land of Goshen. He did everything within his power to love his enemies and not to fight or destroy his enemies. Here's a picture of Moses. I thought it was kind of cute. He's standing on the old Pharaoh's crown, sort of a uh, little symbolic of what was to come. When Moses returns to Egypt to set the slaves free, he did not create, a, he didn't lead an armed insurrection. He didn't lead the slaves in rebellion and bloodshed to overthrow the, their captives and escape. He waited on God. He trusted in God. He had faith in God. And at the Red Sea, this is the paradigm of holy war. We serve the same God today that Moses served. Moses said to the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. The Israelites fired not one arrow. They did nothing in the way of combat. The sea was opened, they escaped, and God destroyed Pharaoh's armies. The horse and rider were thrown into the sea. This is paradigm of holy war. This is how God fights. This is what I believe Melchizedek explained to Abraham. I believe this is the, the same message for us today as, as followers and the children of Abraham. Lois Barrett in The Way God Fights, she says, in holy war the people and the leaders were to rely on God alone for the victory. They did not need large armies. They did not need modern weapons. God would work through their faith, not their military power. 
So what about Amalek in the war with the Amalekites? This time they didn't stand still, but they were told to fight. Why did they have to fight here but not at the Red Sea? If you remember the story, they went out into the wilderness. There was no food, and finally God sent the manna. There was no water. Moses struck the rock and gave them water. Whoops, can you go back one, please? Or back, yeah, to the Malachites. Am Amalek means trouble. The Malachites mean trouble. And this is my second proposition. That war is the result of sin. The moment before the Amalekites struck, the people had stones in their hands and they were about to kill Moses. They were in such total rebellion and such a deep state of sin that suddenly the army's trouble comes over the horizon. And this time, war is punishment for sin. They had to fight. They had to go out there and do hand-to-hand -hand combat as punishment for their sin. When they came to the borders of Canaan with Moses, he said, go into the land. I will send the angel. God will send his angel to drive out the inhabitants. The angel and the hornets. Now, I've never met an angel with a sword, but I have met uh, some of these guys. Believe me, when the hornets come to your house, you're going to move. And when the angel comes, you're going to move. This, the, the first invasion of the land was to be a gradual, nonviolent penetration. The angel and the hornets were going to drive out the people. If they had had faith, they could have walked in, and that's what would have happened. And the gods of the Canaanites, the polytheistic Canaanites, those gods would have fallen, just like the gods in Egypt had fallen. This is a battle between polytheism and monotheism. They destroyed the gods of Egypt, the ten gods with the ten plagues, and he was about to destroy the gods of the Canaanites, but they refused to go. They rebelled, and so Moses said, okay, back to the desert, you're all going to die. And then they said, no, we're going to do it now, and they took the sword in their own hand, man-made jihad, man-made holy war, and they went into the land, they were soundly defeated, thousands died, and they retreated into the desert to where they died. Now, this was plan A, a gradual nonviolent penetration of the land. Plan B came with Joshua. This is what uh, Guy Hirschberger calls the, the permissive will of God. The permissive will of God is not his original plan. This is plan B. Plan B meant they had to go into the land. They had to kill every man, every woman, and every baby. Could you do that? They didn't do it either. They, they got sick of it, and they quit. They did not drive all, all the Canaanites. They were unable to do what, what's called a harem. Uh, here's Guy, Guy Hershberger. He says, Undoubtedly, Israel's fighting was the consequence of her own sins and contrary to the intentions of God. It is not God's plan that men should sin, but if they choose sin, he can still use them to carry out his eternal purposes. This is an Amish theologian named Obadiah Nielsen. Obadiah wrote about harem. He says, the victims of a harem, that's where you slaughter everybody, cannot continue the cycle of violence. Yahweh did not command human violence to rescue or free the people or to get their women, treasure, or land. If you went to battle for Yahweh, you had to wipe out every living thing and take nothing at all. If that thought rightfully sickened you, your only alternative was to work out a peaceful solution. As the Middle East had been bathed in the blood of nonstop harems and revenge, Yeshua, Jesus, appeared with the solution, love your enemies. Millard Lind, his book, Yahweh is a Warrior, he says, Yahweh, as a god of war, fought for his people by miracle, not by sword and spear. Yahweh's warfare was directed not only against Israel's enemies, but at times against Israel herself, in such cases, not by means of miracle, but by the armies of Israel's enemies. So as soon as Joshua died, you begin to hear this refrain that appears throughout the Old Testament. And then they went a-whoring after the gods of the Canaanites or the Midianites or the Edomites. And Yahweh was wrath, and he caused these armies to rise up against him. So God used heathen armies to punish Israel for her sins. They did not drive out all the Canaanites. They didn't do the harem. And as a result of their sin, they became 
slaves to the Canaanites until Deborah came along. Deborah kind of didn't, I don't think she fully understood holy war, but she understood part of it because when the battle was over, she said, the stars fought against the, Can the Canaanites, the river fought against the Canaanites, Yahweh fought against the Canaanites, the wind and the hail and the rain and the sleet. She saw that God was fighting against the Canaanites, but by the day the day was over, Barak had killed a couple of thousand people, which means they didn't quite get it, but Deborah was on the trail of, of this holy war teaching. Gideon, I call this the on-the-job training guy. He really didn't have a clue. He has this big army, and God says, okay, cut it back, cut it back. He ends up with 300 men. They, they have torches and, and bugles. Okay, God's trying to show Israel, this is how I fight. You don't fight. You blow the trumpet and light the torches, and I'll do the rest. And when they did that, the uh, Midianites killed each other. They slaughtered each other in the night. However, Gideon and his men pursued them to the brook of Jabon or Jabbok or something and killed a bunch of them as they were escaping, which they shouldn't have done. They should have just let God do it all. Samuel understood it. I cannot find anything wrong with Samuel. I can find something wrong with almost every, everybody in the Bible, the Old Testament, but not Samuel. Samuel completely understood when the Philistines had them surrounded. He called the people together to Gilgal, I think, and he built an altar and he sacrificed the ox. And as the smoke went up, the Philistines went into a panic and they killed each other. End of story. God delivered the people through his miraculous power. And he, he does it because of faith. Samuel had faith and he understood the way God fights. We all love David because we're so much like David. We're flip-floppers. We are. We're flip-floppers. That will speak for myself especially. There are moments when we're so holy and so right and so righteous and there are moments when we're dallying in sin and we're, we're stupid. You know, David had it all. Now, David made a mistake when he went to fight Goliath. He said... God's going to smite you down. And then David smote him down. He should have let God open the ground the way God sucked down Korah and all those rebels. He should have waited for God to send fire from the heaven like uh, Elisha did when he called down fire. Instead, David picks up five stones, smooth stones from the brook. That wasn't holy war. David had five doubts. And he, when he killed the, dra the, the dragon... <laughs> Well, he was working with the dragon. When he killed the giant, who got the glory? David. David killed his 10,000. Saul killed his 1,000. Yahweh did not get the glory for that. And this promoted or propelled David into the kingship. Hadn't been king very long when he's having adultery with this woman. Because of his adultery, because of his sin, God said, now the sword will never depart from your house. War is the result of sin. You know, when President Bush says, well, it's warfare from now on out. Well, yeah, this country has sinned greatly. It is warfare from now on out. Because God's the same God today as he was then. Um, David, David had, like, like I say, he was a flip-flopper. He was a great prophet. He had these great moments of spirituality. He understood when Saul was killing him, and he had Saul a couple of times asleep and he had him there, he could have killed him. And he said, wait, wait, God will take care of Saul. So David got there. Sometimes he was right there, but on his deathbed, the man who called himself a man of peace, and if you look at the last thing, he said, I am a man of peace. On his deathbed, he ordered the execution of another man, which so, I don't know if he got it, but he wrote these words for us. The meek will inherit the land. Isn't that what Jesus said? And enjoy great peace. Those who love violence, his soul hates. Away from me, you bloodthirsty men. Seek peace and pursue it. Too long have I lived among those who hate peace. I am a man of peace, but when I speak, they are for war. I feel that way whenever I meet Christians. When I speak, I am a man of peace, but they are for war. Now, David actually had an... Uh, sort of a misunderstanding, a misconception of himself. He said, I'm a man of peace. But when he went to build the temple, God says, no, you're a warrior. You have blood all over your hands. You're a little bit, you think you're a man of peace, but you cannot build the temple for me. I, I can't tell you how often when I tell Christians you can't go to war, they have this knee-jerk reaction. They say, but David, yeah, I can just 
Before I say it, I know they're going to say, but David. And, and I say, look, David couldn't build the temple because he had blood on his hands. If you go to war and kill people, your body is the temple of Yahweh. How are you going to build that temple if David couldn't do it? And you're going to follow David. And then I say, okay, you can follow David and you can follow Moses. I'm following Jesus. Solomon, the man of peace, this is one of my paintings, was able to build the temple. So Solomon started out as the greatest man of great wisdom. He ended up as a great fool. Being a man of peace and being a monotheist is not enough. You've got to obey the gospel of the kingdom. You've got to follow it in every area of your life. He ends up worshiping Moloch, burning thousands of little girls on the altars to Moloch. The wisest man became the greatest fool. So just believing in the gospel of peace and believing in, in the one God, that's not going to cut it because it didn't cut it for, for Solomon. But he did leave us some wonderful words of wisdom. If a man pays back evil for good, evil will never leave his house. This is what David did when he had Uriah killed. Do not gloat when your enemies fall, when he stumbles. Do not let your heart rejoice. If your enemy is hungry, this is Romans 12, give him food to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. And this is my favorite. When a man's ways please Yahweh, he makes his enemies to be at peace with him. That's exactly what happened with Yitzhak. His ways please God. And when he continually refused to fight, God brought his enemies to him and they made peace with him. The big question people always say, well, you know, if somebody breaks in your house and they're going to rape you, well, they're all going to do, right? I've heard that so many times. And I say, when my ways please God... He's going to take care of my enemies and make them be at peace with me. Guess what? No one has ever broken in my house tried to rape my wife. Now, there's no guarantee that that won't happen, and I'll have to find it some reason, but the reason will lie with me. If I'm living in sin, I cannot count on God's protection. If I'm living in outward, overt sin, I can't expect my enemies to break in my house and try to rape my wife and kill my children. So my... Standing, I stand in faith, in obedience to the word, and I know that God will deliver me, that, that he is my warrior, he is my defender, he's my rock, he's my high tower, he's my shield, he's my buckler, he's my sword, he's my feet shod with his gospel. Almost Jonathan. Jonathan almost became the king. He almost understood holy war and the, God, the way God fights because when he and his sword bearer were out in the woods and they discovered a garrison of Philistines, he said, God can deliver with many or few. Let's go get them. And as they rushed across the valley, the earth began to tremble. The garrisons fell. The Philistines who were camped up and down the whole valley, I don't know if it was 30 or 50,000 of them, flew into a panic and killed each other. And by the end of the day, the Philistines were all dead. But Jonathan killed and his friend 20 Philistines didn't have enough faith to go the whole distance. He almost had it right. Now here's a couple of guys who got it right. Jehoshaphat and Jehaziel the prophet. They found the city surrounded by Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, and Syrians. And God spoke to the prophet Jehaziel, and he goes to Jehoshaphat. He says, ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of Yahweh. Almost word for word what Moses said at the Red Sea. And Jehoshaphat believed him. And the next day when they went out on the battlefield, they were all dead. Not only did they believe him, but Jehoshaphat put his singers out in the front as they marched out into the, the battle. They were playing musical instruments because they knew the battle was over and they had won by faith. A few years later, the Syrians invade. Elisha's servant wakes up in the morning. He's in a panic. He runs. He wakes up Elisha. He says, oh, we're surrounded. We're going to be killed. And Elisha says, fear not, for they that are with us are more than they that are with them. And then he prays for God to open the eyes of the servant. The servant's eyes are open. He sees the chariots of God and the hosts of God surrounding the city. And then Elisha asks for God to strike the Syrians with blindness. He leads them to the king of Israel who, who had no clue about God or holiness or anything. I don't think any of the kings of Israel were pronounced good. They were all wicked. 
Uh, and he says, well, good, let's kill him. And Elisha, understanding kind of a, a little bit like Lee said last night, the way of, of nature giving of itself to pre produce life, he says, no, give them food and send them home. Love your enemies, feed your enemies. And that's exactly what they did. I think it says of the Syrians that they never came back and troubled Israel again. But a few years later, the, the Assyrians came and they had the city surrounded. And here's another man who understood it. He understood the way God fights and the way that we're supposed to respond. Hezekiah puts on sackcloth. He goes into the temple. He brings the scroll. He throws it out before the Lord. He says, your word says right here that you will defend us, that you will destroy our enemies. I believe it. I'm trusting you. During the night, the angel of Yahweh came into the camp of the Assyrians, killed 185,000 men, not just soldiers, but the best warriors among them. When they woke in the morning, they left Israel, they fled, left, left everything behind. And the Israelites did not have to fight a single sword. This is the same angel that, that would have been there when they first went into Canaan, the angel of Yahweh. He appears throughout the Bible. He would have gone in there and killed, killed or destroyed or driven out anyone who resisted them. He's there today. We have the angel of Yahweh. If you trust and you believe, he's on your side. But it's all faith. The just shall live by faith, not by their swords. It's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And then the whole world was in great expectation. The Messiah, the warrior, was coming, the warrior king. And here he is. Well, there he is. <laughs> the warrior king, the gentle shepherd, who fully understood the father. He had the father's teaching. He had the Father's Spirit. He had everything. He was the image of the Father. When he spoke, the Father was speaking through him. When he worked miracles, the Father was working through him. He was not the Father, but he had it all, and he restored this concept, and he left us his wonderful words in the New Testament. He says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of the wolves. Be ye therefore as wise as serpents, and as harmless as doves. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Resist not evil. Whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. I think you've all read these scriptures. You know, he basically is saying, love your enemies, do good to them. Pray for those who persecute you and mistreat you, that you may be the children of your Father who is in heaven. He's only a warrior against those who walk in disobedience to him and hatred to him. He's our loving father. And he will fight for us. Upon his arrest, Jesus told Peter, Put up thy sword. All who take the sword will perish with the sword. Thinkest thou not that I can call my father and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? Those were the legions that were camped around the city that Elisha saw and his servants saw. And I see, and if you had eyes to see, you would see them too. Back to Abraham, because it really pivots on Abraham. We talked about how Abraham surrendered the matriarchy. When God asked him to surrender his son, he surrendered his son. When he was, God was going to destroy Sodom, Abraham did not say, good, we need to do that kill those homosexuals. He begged God not to kill anyone. He was a man of love. He was a man of peace. He didn't try to force his views on anybody. But he did have what I would call Abraham's sin. When God told Abraham, leave your land, and leave your kin, and go to the country, I will show you. Abraham left his land. He went to the country. But he brought his kin with him. He brought Lot with him and Lot's rowdy band of men, before too long, on the verge of war. Abraham's men and Lot's men were fighting. And so what did Abraham do? He surrendered the land. That's the last thing men will fight for. They'll fight for their wives and their daughters, for their sons and the land. He surrendered the land. He said, Lot, it's yours. Take whatever you want. And this is what we have to be willing to do as as the sons of Abraham and daughters of Abraham. 
We have to be able to, to surrender our, our spouses, surrender our sons, surrender our daughters, surrender our land. Who, who, he who loves mother and father more than me is not worthy of my kingdom. We have to surrender even our own lives. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they love not their lives even unto death. We have to be willing to surrender that all. As Jesus surrendered his life, he laid it down without taking up the sword and, and fighting for it. The early Christians understood it. Tertullian, shall it be held lawful to make an occupation in the army when the Lord proclaims that those who use the sword shall perish by the sword? And shall the son of peace take part in the battle when it does not become him to sue in a law court? On the contrary, if a soldier gets converted, he must abandon the military immediately. That was the teaching of the early Christians. 253 AD, Origen of Alexandria said, We no longer take up swords against nations, nor do we learn war anymore, but are become the children of peace. Cyprian said bitterly, If murder is committed privately, it is a crime. But if it happens with state authority, courage is the name for it. He said, The guiltless are not permitted even to put the guilty to death. And finally, in 310, Arnobius said that non-resistance had been the position of the Christians since the beginning of the church. Non-resistance. Resist not evil. And along came Constantine. Constantine. I could say the Roman eagle kills the lamb. Well, we know what he did to the Trinity. Once you've brought people away from the real, true God, you end up in Romans where Paul talks about, and when they worship the creator, the creature, more than the creator, he gave them over to all kinds of abominations. Constantine brought in all sorts of pagan religions, Christmas, Sunday, um, Easter, Astarte's Day. He brought in all these pagan customs. He built these ornate cathedrals. He put statues of himself in these cathedrals. Um, the list goes on and on of what Constantine did. If, if there was ever a derailer of the church, before he was done within a few years, to be a Roman soldier, you had to be a Christian. Originally, the Roman soldiers gradually, I think by 180 AD, there was an account of a few Christians that were in the Roman army, but just a very few. But after Constantine, you couldn't be a pagan and be in the Roman army. So he took the gentle followers of the Lamb and he made... Uh, eagles out of them. Oh, wait, that's our symbol, the eagle. Uh, ours, the American symbol. <laughs> now, Roland Baton, a Yale historian, says, the taking of life in war was unanimously condemned by all Christian writers prior to Constantine. Broadly speaking, three attitudes to war were to appear in the Christian ethic. Pacifism, 300 years of it. The just war, about 700 years. And the crusade, chronologically, they appeared in just this order. We are in the age of the crusade. When the war was first launched over there in Iraq, Bush said this is a crusade and somebody pulled him up and said you can't use that word and they, they dropped that word. We see it. We even have evangelists who do crusades. A crusade is the war of the cross and if you're a Muslim that means uh, the worst possible word you could use in their language. It means you're a Muslim hater and you want to kill them all. But that is, that's the time frame we're in. We've been in that time frame since the 12th century when the Crusades began. We are now in the 21st century. And only a handful of people see the gospel of peace and understand it. And I hope that I'm convincing some of you today that it's there and it's been there from the beginning. Oops, can you go back one for me, please? Go back one more, too. Okay, I've been trying to convince you that Yahweh is the sole warrior. War is punishment for sin. And how Yahweh fights from Melchizedek. Yitzhak and Yaakov understood it. Moses understood it. Others partially understood it like Samuel and Jehaziel. Yeshua restored it and he modeled it. He lived it out. He said this is how you live. And when your enemies come for you and you're hanging on the cross you say forgive them father. You don't call down the 12,000 angels. You don't call the 12 legions down. You don't call down fire upon the Sumerians in a village. He says, that's not the spirit that I'm of. My father is not like that. The early Christians understood it. 
Rome destroyed it, and as the gospel of the kingdom is being restored, the message of pacifism and nonviolence is being restored. Without peace and holiness, you shall not see God. I believe that's in Hebrews. Just as people took the word kingdom out of the gospel, they clipped the word peace off of that sentence. And they say, without holiness, you will not see God. But it's scripture says, without peace and holiness, no one shall see God. What to expect in the 21st century? Where there is smoke, there is fire. What with our scientists feverishly producing bigger and more fiendish weapons? And what with the oil-rich Muslim nations purchasing these weapons in a mad rush? I mournfully and solemnly predict that as we enter this century, we will see the planet racked, cracked, scorched, poisoned, polluted, burned, scathed, scarred, scared, nuked, and inundated with larger and more deadly wars. We're living in the time of the days of Noah when the violence is escalating, and we've seen it already escalating. Beginning in the last century, more people were killed in wars in the 20th century than in all the previous centuries combined, and, and that was just the beginning. We're now moving into to more deadly where they're talking about nuclear bombs in Iran. They're actually talking about it, making plans for those things. So what should we do? I don't want to leave you depressed thinking there's no hope. There is hope. For the children of Abraham, there is hope. Four things. Seek Yahweh with all your heart. Love Yahweh with all your heart and your mind and strength. Follow Yeshua's gospel of the kingdom that calls us to love all people, including our enemies, and do violence to no one. And stand still and see the salvation of Yahweh.